What's good, fam? It's your man CJ Williams putting on for Cultureless Theory. And today we're presenting you with the results of the arduous task of selecting what we believe to be the top 10 hip hop albums of the 90s. We know that one or two, hell, maybe even three joints that you really believe should be here just ain't make it. So for those records, talk about them in the comments below. And per usual, this list will not include any mixtapes, soundtracks, or EPs, just full length albums, all right? Now be sure to like, follow, and subscribe if you haven't already, and check out our Discord link in the description to continue the convo. All right, now the foreplay is over with, it's time to get down to business. Number 10, Outkast, Equimini. As was the case for a lot of hip hop artists in the 90s, Antoine Big Boy Patton and Andre Dre Benjamin continually improved their output with each subsequent release. Having developed a pattern of dropping every two years, their 1998 junior release, Equimini, was a hotly anticipated record from these two dope boys that favored El Dorados and Brohams. Being that we were still trying to finish high school ourselves at the time, only now did we ever come to realize that the lead single skewed on the Barbie, featuring Wu-Tang's chef Raekwon never charged on any of the major list of the time. Not the top 100, 200, or the hip hop and R&B charts. But we ain't give a single solitary you know what, cause that junk was harder than an AP calculus test your first week in class. In spite of the organized noise track getting no chart love, the full project turned out to be one of the original albums to earn that all elusive five mic rating from the Source magazine right out the gate. The follow up single Rosa Parks with its infectious hook that the subject's namesake initially took issue with did peak at number 19 on the hip hop and R&B charts. The thing about an Outkast album though is that they always had more in store for the listener than just radio hits. Take for instance the left fielder Space Jam synthesizer with Mr. P-Funk himself George Clinton coming along for the ride or the 7 minute jam session slash down south TED talk Spodioti Dopalicious before those were even a thing. More thought provoking lines can be caught on the opening track Return of the G. The title track is perfect for just vibing out to and big boy story about Susie Screw sick his duck on the art of storytelling part one was the perfect setup for Andre to enlighten us about the perilous plight of her partner Sasha Thumper. The video version even added one of rap's best storytellers, a fresh out of the pen slick Rick, who went on to name his next album after said track. Okim and I went triple platinum and peaked just shy of the top spot on both the Billboard 200 and Hip Hop and R&B charts. The originality spilling from this AAA release remains an exclamation point that the South had a lot to say that we wanted to hear over and over and over again. Number nine the Roots, things fall apart. The legendary Roots crew from Philly, PA, composed of mainstays Malik B, Dice Raw, Black Thought, and Quest Love have had plenty of years to gel, learning to bounce off one another with ease by the time we receive this overlooked gem. Contrasting to their Queens, New York contemporaries, a tribe called Quest, the Roots were all about the live band sound over the jazz samples. The MCs here were also a little edgier, creating their own niche in the hip hop field. No better evidence of that can be found on joints such as Dynamite, the energetic 100 100% Dundee and ain't saying nothing new where Dice gives one of his most fierce performances yet. The way that Black Thought lets you know he used up your lady without professing it the way that almost any other brother would is one of the many reasons his pen is highly respected. Knowing how much of a menace he is on the mic, there are a few new special guests who managed to hold their own between tracks number 54 and 71. The quickly rising Broad Street Bully aka Beanie Siegel joins Thought, Raw, and Malik for some freestyle fun before Rozelle makes some music with his mouth as the track fades to black. Prior to converting over to Yasin Bey, Most Def was the moniker of the man who rocked beside Thought on Double Trouble over a head nodding beat that we're surprised hasn't been reused by any big name artist yet. To balance things out, Shy Towns Nas, aka Com Sense, BKA Common, takes Plug 2 and drops some bars on the smoothed out Act 2, Love of My Life. A reissued deluxe version supplied an equally dope remix minus con. Then in 2002, Love of My Life found its way on the Brown Sugar soundtrack, omitting Tariq, adding Lonnie back, along with Andre's baby mama, oh, excuse me, neo soul singer Erica Badu. You be the judge if there's any relations going on here. Speaking of Badu, she also brought light to the tune You Got Me, alongside another Philadelphia bred FMC, the vicious pit bull in a skirt, EVE Jeffers, or just plain Eve. MCA Records must have been aiding and abetting Diddy with his baby oil addiction the way they allowed the promotion to slip for this album, only releasing the next movement as the second and final single. Accounting for all of the grooving instrumentals, styles, and bars spread across this magnum opus, 
far more of this record should have been shared with the masses. Go back and watch our ranking of the Roots catalog if you care to hear about the numbers it did or other facts of interest. But suffice it to say that the last Roots Crew album with the trio of Thought, Malik, and Raw intact is one of hip hop's best. Number eight. Wu-Tang Clan. Enter the Wu-Tang, 36 Chambers. Undoubtedly one of the most iconic and important albums in hip hop, there's no surprise that 36 Chambers sliced the spot into this prestigious list. Arriving in tandem with another album that we'll be going over a bit later, there were a total of nine razor sharp swordsmen equipped with deadly venoms in the fold. They would all eventually go on to release solo projects to varying degrees of success, but these are the fallopian tubes of which they plopped out of. Yeah, we straight up summoned our inner ruler zigzag a lot right there. Two members managed to secure solo tracks within, Clan in the Front by the genius aka the Jizza, and the eponymous Method Man, which are some of the most lyrically impressive no doubt. The only track closest to having the entire crew on it is Protect Your Neck, which also happens to be one of the many phrases that comes to the front of your dome when their name is found in any given mouthpiece. The other would be Cash Rules Everything Around Me aka Cream, which has become a ubiquitous term for them dead green faces that we do the dirtiest deeds for. You God's brief yet potent delivery sparks the mystery of chess boxing off properly before the man with no face comes through to hit it out the park like a spiked bat for Master Killer to reel in and close the track out on his lone appearance. Ghost also breathes some emotion into these chambers with his appearance on Tears and Can It All Be So Simple with his eventual right hand man Chef Raekwon. Old Dirty Bastard is the bright green highlighter on every single area he enters with animated deliveries and overall randomness that somehow fits like a perfectly worn in Timberland boot. The RZA's wickedness weapon was cooking up the entirety of this record's murky sounds that seamlessly meshed with obscure kung fu flick mementos, contributing to its one-of-a-kind sound. And once this Staten Island collective came from beneath the surface, over 3 million plus heads came to quickly realize and it's remained that way ever since. Number 7, Jay-Z, Reasonable Doubt. Very few of us realized at the time how valuable and important this album would be to hip hop and its creator when it arrived rather unceremoniously in the summer of 96. Sure, we bopped our heads to Ain't No with Fox Boogie when it came on the radio, but having to be very choosy of what we purchased with limited funds as teenagers, Reasonable Doubt wasn't the one most of us were checking for. Sure, it went gold in less than four months of its release, but it didn't touch platinum status until early 2002. We think it's safe to say that it wasn't until Jay gave us the blueprint in 01 that a lot of heads started to circle back to his debut and had that oh shit moment of what he delivered on that first little tape of his all those years ago. 22 twos is delivered with the confidence of a rapper who's been in the game far longer than he actually was, while paying homage to a tribe called Quest or outright biting them depending on who you ask. The B.I.G. featured Brooklyn's Finest should have been a single and only became revered long after its initial coming, just as the movie Carlito's Way was, which is referenced at the start of the track. I mean, Chris even joked about his wife having two pox if she had twins, right in the midst of Shakur claiming he did the do with his baby mama. Before christening himself Irv Gotti, it was DJ Irv who produced the first of his many flips of Isaac Hayes' The Look of Love on Can I Live, which feels like it played right off of feeling it. Hove certainly got the queen of hip hop soul on a discount price on the first rate Can't Knock the Hustle, which he later ended up reusing his own lines to create that Jiggy era hit with Jermaine Dupri. If you know, you know. We get our first sampling of his hometown sidekick Memphis Bleak on Coming of Age, as they do a decent job of sharing the mic over this piano looped bass track. We also can't conclude this story without mentioning Dead Presidents too, you know. That's the joint where Sean would later tell Nazir that he was using his voice wrong, making it a hot song rather than just a hot line. Hey, hey, it just fits. Not even the rap bible realized this album's greatness at first, giving it a solid 4 mic rating before eventually re-rating it as a top notch classic. That wouldn't be the first time that's happened and Reasonable Doubt isn't the only one of this list that's experienced the same scenario. Keep watching as the plot thickens, culturalists. Keep watching as the plot thickens, theorists. Number six, the notorious B.I.G., Life After Death. Contrasting the 94's Ready to Die, 97's Life After Death got its five mic stamp of approval right from the start. Do we agree with that? Well, here's a better question. Do you want to hear Puff Daddy up in half of the track list talking shit all the time? And if you want to argue that you'd pull up Nasty Boy, Another, My Downfall, or I Love the Dough every single time you put this album on, then hey, that's what our comment section is for. While we're at it, Player Hater is hella fun funny and a great display of Mr. Wallace's humor, but your overall mood at the moment will determine if you're up for it or not because that singing? Ugh. 
it gets a little tricky. But now that we've got that out of the way, it's time to show our love to this only other body of work that the rap Nicky Tarantino got to complete before he left this earth far too soon. Out of the 24 tracks, the mouthwatering meat within far outweighs the bone and gristle expected when the runtime is pushing two hours deep. Nearly all moods are covered in fine fashion throughout. The dearly departed homie song is Miss You featuring 112, who's the most shouted out group this side of Brooklyn if you ask us. Inspiration is felt on another 112 lace joint in Sky's the Limit. Tales about drugs and guns are well covered on 10 Crack Commandments, What's Beef, Somebody's Got to Die, and The Very Eerie You're Nobody. Besides introducing the world to the locks on Last Day, the Midwest gets an invite to the party on Notorious Thugs featuring Bone Thugs and Harmony, where B.I.G. impressively changes his flow up to be on par with the tongue-twisting barbs from Cleveland's finest. His glossy account of getting the sneaky link box in two different ways on I Got a Story to Tell is pure ear candy. And don't act like you didn't throw on F for you tonight with R. Kells when you were trying to appease the skis of the moment with some thug passion. Once you were old enough to do all that, of course. Speaking of making hot lines over hot songs, Frank Wizite took his own line from this. Licking the door, waving the 4-4. All you heard was Papa, don't hit me no more. And simply morph it into this. Licking the door, waving the 4-4. All you heard was Papa, don't hit me no more. Ah, you see how that worked? Of course, it wouldn't be hip hop if Chris never borrowed from his rapping forefathers, now would it? Prime example, the hook for his original return in the 9-7 on Hypnotize wouldn't be what it was if it wasn't for Dougie Fresh and Slick Rick's la di da from 1980 something. Justice Hoves, I Just Wanna Love You wouldn't be as dope as it is, minus those smooth ass lines he jacked from the world is filled, featuring Puffy and Too Short. Oh yeah, and then there's that super popular joint with Puff, Mace, and an uncredited Kelly Price called Mo Money, Mo Problems that everybody couldn't get enough of. We can only imagine how much of a monster a third album with his full input and less D-I-D-D-Y would have been. But at least we'll always have this diamond selling effort to remind us of how great a talent we bear witness to. Number five. Tupac, Me Against the World. Like Marvin Gaye's first posthumous album, Dream of a Lifetime, 11 years prior, the album cover image for what we're crowning as Tupac Shakur's best belies the actual content found within. A listen to the first track, If I Die Tonight, suggests that one like this would have been more fitting. Me Against the World serves as a deep dive into the psyche of a young black male with a tormented soul, at a crossroads with his maker and his death, and a violence-filled hell on earth. Just listen to Lord Knows and the conviction that he raps with throughout. If we were to ever drop a list of rappers or albums with the most gripping feelings on wax, Pac or this album would easily top it. Same could be said for So Many Tears and the paranoia-laced Death Around the Corner with a perfectly placed untouchable sound bite at the end. I want that son of a bitch dead. I want you to get this fuck where he breathes. I want him dead. I want his family dead. I want his house burnt to the ground. I want to go to the middle of the night. I want to piss on his ass. You may have thought your parents or grandparents were on their old people stuff when they preached to you that there's power in the tongue. But after hearing how much he visualized his demise through song, only for it to actually take place over a year and some months after this drop, with Big mirroring his rhetoric, certainly you became a believer then. As anyone who'd been listening to Pac from the start would know, his projects are multifaceted, going from fuck the world to pinning the most glowing tribute a mother could ever hope to receive by way of this classic right here. There's no way I could pay you back, but my plan is to show you that I understand. You all appreciate it. As of this writing, the National Recording Registry only contains four hip hop songs, with this and La Di Da Di being half of them. So there's that. Thugs get lonely and got heart too, so what better way to show and prove that on the cuts like Temptations and Can You Get Away? Following that, he opens up about his oppressed freedom and serving the crack fiends at age 17 on It Ain't Easy over a mellowed out track. The man said himself in an interview that he prophesied being on lockdown and the judge not letting him out on bail, which translates to Shakur never enjoying the immediate success Me Against the World created, debuting atop the Billboard 200 charts. In turn, that made him the first artist with a number one album while locked in the pen. Not exactly what anyone would try to do on purpose, but that's the way it went down. For all those who never got a chance to experience Tupac while he was here, this eventual five mic recipient is the best place to begin to figure out why he's one of the greatest rappers of all time. Number four, 
A Tribe Called Quest, Midnight Marauders. November 9, 1993 turned out to be one of the best days in hip hop history. Not only giving us the aforementioned 36 Chambers record, but also the abstract Shahid and Fife's third LP, Midnight Marauders. Between this and 91's Low End Theory, it's equivalent to swapping around two pennies trying to determine which one's better than the other. Spoiler alert, they're damn near the same, and today Marauders gets our top vote. Ask us next week, and it might be theory. However you want to put it, this Queen's Bread trio found their stride here. Large Professor produced and appeared on the Thumper Keep It Rolling, while Fife Dog uses his solo joint to report his continuous string of problems in hyperbolic fashion on 8 million stories. Usually if we catch an MC repeating the same verse within the same song, we'd flag them down on their lethargy. But in this case of Sucker Nigga, we've concluded that Tip was going for emphasis on where the phrase came from and how its use has evolved over time. Let Fat Joe tell it, he can use it just as freely as Raekwon does, but we digress. A war tour with De La Soul's True Goy the Dove on the hook, rest in peace, is a neck snapper that was perfect for radio without sounding like that was its only purpose for existing. With a plethora of simple yet complexly layered rhymes, these brothers weren't lying when they boasted about having lyrics to go. Say for instance that super cool layback joint, Electric Relaxation, where Five Diggy snuck this in on us. Let me hit it from the back, girl, I won't catch a hernia. Off on your couch, now you got Siemens furniture. We love to execute our own analysis of the words on this track alone, and we ponder why nobody producing for 94's Above the Rim soundtrack didn't pick up his soundbite about how he's above the rim. Get it? Okay. But what we can do though is link you to a phenomenal deep dive of this album, complete with the recreation of the narrator's voice that'll leave you scratching your head like a turntable. So don't forget to check for it in the description. The only reason this isn't higher is because the impact and staying power of these last three is Fort Knox Impenetrable. Number three, Snoop Doggy Dog doggy style. Seeing how well he helped carry Dr. Dre's debut solo project in 92, it took just under a year for Snoopy Snoop to helm his own solo debut. However, this go round, the musical doctor remained strictly behind the boards, leaving this smooth flowing gangster to do as he pleases over his production. Actually, drop some zigzag ashes on that. He does make cameo vocal appearances on the intro and p Funk's smother lead single, Who Am I? An oft overlooked fact about the G-Funk intro, the Lady of Rage took that line about rocking rough and stuff with her afro puffs and made it into not just a hot song but her signature song for the above the rim soundtrack featuring the same group of homies from the chronic in tow and a few new voices doggy style turned out to be another important piece of not only west coast or gangster rap but music overall what would mariah have used for her heartbreaker remix if not for it ain't no fun alongside corrupt nate dog and his little cousin warren g the margin between calvin c brodus being in jail for life and becoming a world-renowned star was as slim as the space between the open palm and that bitch's ass on Doggy Style's cover when it comes to murder was the case. Hey, it's a female dog, right? <laughs> For those clueless on how not to give a fuck, Rage and the Dog Pound entered the stage to assist Snoop to get the point across, whereas the latter plus 70s soul group, the Dramatics, do a terrific job in marrying the old school with the new on Doggy Dog World. We still love its equally entertaining video clip. This chart topping record remains his best selling effort to this day, and that's after three plus decades and almost 20 solo LPs. We could say more, but we think you get the picture here. Doggy Style's position will always be a staple in more ways than one. Number two, Dr. Dr. Dre, the chronic. Dizam! If more artists would become so enraged with their former homies that masterpieces like this would be the end result, well, who's the next MC to play Eazy E and the notorious Compton G, Dr. Drizze? I mean, seriously, just the year before, Dre, Eazy, and MC Ren were riding hard against their former groupmate Ice Cube on the last NWA album, Niggas for Life. Then, next thing you know, Dre's out of NWA and has his new protege, Snoop Doggy Dogg, riding equally as rough against them all. Fuck with Dre Day serves as a triple XL size middle finger to E with a hilarious video parody to boot, but how about this? The doctor's opening line on Bitches Ain't Shit, aka the track that riled up activists with names like Calvin O. Butts and C. Dolores Tucker, goes a little something like this. I used to know a bitch named Mary Wright. Yeah, when these brothers had a problem with each other, that shit was called out loud and direct, like your number in the DMV line. But ah, back to the lecture at hand. Dre had already put us on notice that he was a producer extraordinaire. His heavy use of P-Funk 
song, George Clinton samples were morphed into what became known as the G-Funk sound, defining not only gangster rap itself, but an entire era. Throw in a slew of new death row inmates to rock the mic as labeled on the album's cover, and The Chronic became the one to beat. It pioneered far more than what we've got time to go over, but let's take the permanently emblazoned pop culture phrase, these nuts for instance. <laughs> Where did that come from, you ask? From Mr. Warren Griffin the third, just messing around on the phone with the chick on the song of the same name. It was also the first time we got to hear the other guy who he's forever linked to, Nate Dogg, aka the eventual king of hip hop hooks. Farmville VA's Lady of Rage got national exposure courtesy of Stranded on Death Row. And we don't know about y'all, but we ain't never heard nobody be labeled as a biatch, not just a bitch, but a biatch, until Uncle Snoop smeared it all over this record. I mean, an E-40 verse wouldn't be able to end properly if it's not capped off with a high-pitched yelp of at the end. And just how our parents instantly knew the late Frankie Beverly and May's hit Before I Let Go by its opening riff, Dre and Snoop provided our generation the same type of vibe with one of the best hip hop tracks ever crafted. Deep Cover was the test run in 91, but with nothing but a G thing, the LBC was officially put on the map, becoming the blueprint of how a proper back and forth flow is supposed to go on wax. The DRE even carried a track by his lonesome on the drop top Ready Let Me Ride. Honestly, it sounded just as good to our ears as his rival Cubes It Was A Good Day that was simultaneously in radio rotation. Just as the chronic and G-Funk wouldn't be what it is without its parliament funkadelic parent, there would also be no power or any of its multiple spinoffs, the game's rhyme book would be far less interesting, and Eminem may have found his end right on that 8 mile road if not for Andre Young reaching the highest level of pistivity at right, first name Eric. Much to the chagrin of its detractors, this batch of hellified gangster shit is now preserved in the National Recording Registry right beside 36 Chambers and our number one one rap album to bow in the 90s, which is number one, Nas Illmatic. If any of you watching have been keeping count, half of this list is comprised of debut albums. That tells us that the level of artistry within this decade was nothing short of spectacular. There's a saying that you have your whole life to write your first album. Your focus is to simply get your message out into the world in the best ways you know how. Previews of a young Nasir Ben Alou Durad Jones through his features on Main Source and MC Search Records certainly got heads interested in what a complete outing from him would sound like. They certainly didn't realize it during conception, but having gang stars DJ Premier, CL Smooth's partner Pete Rock, and Large Professor, among others, to provide canvases for Nasty Nas to verbalize his visions over proved to be crucial. We're gonna call them the Golden Era Team 94, adjacent to the Olympics 92 Dream Team. As we're sure you've picked up by now, there's been a running theme across this list about one-liners becoming entire songs, and the one we have to thank for planting that seed originated here. I'm out for dead presidents to represent me. Paying homage to sentiments from the 1983 Al Pacino feature film Scarface that's become universally adopted by hip hop culture, is it a coincidence that both Nas and Jay would draw influence from two different gangster flicks helmed by Pacino characters that end up shot to death each time? Or that they supposedly shared one chick in particular which was the flame that ignited their early 2000s beef? Eh, just a little fool for thought. And although Nas has never been in the gangster rap category, more influence from the aforementioned Flint commence and conclude the album by way of New York State of Mind, where it's outright name dropped and it ain't hard to tell respectively. Y'all already know how dope that one is, so we ain't gotta stress it this go round. You're also keenly aware of the abundance of hip hop quotables laced within this 40 minute set. So real quick and without Googling, tell us at least two tracks that borrowed from Represent. And if you name them correctly, we'll give you some rap scholar points in the comments. When lamenting on how life's a bitch while putting out a fellow microphone doctor by the name of AZ, it still sounds pleasant, especially across the backdrop of yearning for your love and his father's golden horn to tie it all together. Even Illmatic's album cover has been the subject of debate that another NYC rapper on this list jacked the idea of it for their own just months after this arrived. Can we say the shark niggas interlude from Cuban Links anyone? However, said jacker turned out to be the next one in line to procure a perfectly ready record off the rip by the source three years later. In addition to topping our top 10 1990s hip hop albums list here today, Illmatic also mopped up all contenders on our top 10 of 1994 albums list. Make certain that you revisit that one or go back to it for the first time. And if none of our ranting and raving across two entire videos have you in concurrence with us on Illmatic's greatness, fire up that shit again with a little herbal essence or something like that and holler back at us once you do. And there you have it folks, another dope ass list for our ever-growing collection of clips on culturalist theory. Not like you needed to tell us, but the comment section is all the way open for your opinions on what you agree with, what you didn't, and everything in between. 
you want us to hear. We love doing these kinds of lists for our viewers and if there's a related type clip that we haven't made yet that you think we should let us know. Once again, it's your man CJ Williams and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Until we drop our latest greatest list, peep these clips up top and down bottom. Man, you know I steal -o.